Now, when I was, when I was doing these, I thought this was going to be one of the quickest units to get through. This ended up being the largest slide show in all of them because there's so much really interesting stuff in here. We, sorry, we're not going to do the cahoots. I oh, know, you're disappointed. Your teachers will have access to them all anyway, once I feel fixing all the spelling mistakes. Now, of course, um, if you are using Gwyneth Paltrow and Kim Kardashian as your science um, people, you're in trouble, okay? But it's a really important thing. And I make jokes about the US political system. We're actually not that much better. Um, Basically, there's a lot of influence on science. You guys are going to be living in this world longer than I am, hopefully. Um, but, so you're going to be inheriting a world, you're probably going to be living to well over 100. And most of you, yeah, you'll probably get bored after a while, but that's the way it goes. And so what we're going to do here, as I said earlier on, we're talking about Chernobyl. Um, Meltdowns. Meltdowns are a negative thing on society. So meltdown essentially means that the reactor core, which is the nuclear fuel, goes bang. Nuclear fuel going bang is bad. Okay? What you also have here is we've also had other ones. Um, only eight years ago, Fukushima um, in Japan. There was a big tsunami. Tsunami's not that big a problem. But it is when you have three nuclear reactors on the coast, those three reactors are sitting right next to a nine metre or 10 metre high um, tsunami wall and your tsunami is 11 metres high. It also doesn't work well when you design this reactor so that every um, nuclear reactor is supposed to have a diesel backup generator. Don't put the diesel backup generator in the basement, which is gonna be the first room to be flooded. And so this is why that happened there. So the tsunami destroyed the backup power, bad things happened. Um, what you've also got here as well, Chernobyl, 1986, safety tests went wrong, bad things happened. You're gonna notice a pattern here. In 1978, New York had a nuclear reactor at Three Mile Island, the coolant got blocked, bad things happened. Okay, contamination. There's been numerous ones of these. Um, wind scale, which is in the UK, I think that was the first world nuclear disaster. And that was a problem because um, the way they stopped the radiation getting out was to have a little filter and the filter broke. So all these cows started producing radioactive milk. Now, of course, as well, I talked before about Lucas Heights. Lucas Heights is a small reactor and they've had some accidents. So even a small scale reactor that is used for research and medical treatments, accidents happen. And so you've got to think there, is the nuclear technology worth it for that? Smallpox vaccine, here's another great story in science. Varilation, what's varilation? What was that? Yeah, exposing yourself to a bit of disease. One of the things we don't realise is that um, this goes back over a thousand years. The Chinese were the first people, and correct me if I'm wrong, Chinese were the first people to actually try and inoculate people against disease. I think what happened in this here, I think they got some smallpox people, scraped off their scabs, dried it out, ground it into paper, a pa paper, powder, and this guy here then blew it into your nose. It worked. It reduced the amount of, vaccine, uh, the amount of smallpox. The other story though, the one guy who is credited is this guy here called Edward Jenner. This is a really interesting story because it is a very, it goes, when we talk about ethics, this is the story you talk about. Jenner, um, and this is also another thing there, up until say even 50 years ago, the people who practiced science were the people who were very rich and well off because poor people couldn't afford to do it. Jenner was a rich English aristocrat. He owned a farm and on his farm, he had cows and all sorts of stuff. And he had a whole heap of workers on there. One of the families that worked on there um, had a young boy, I think he was eight years old, called James Phipps. Now, what Jenner noticed was all he hired a lot of young women to milk his cows. They were called cowmates. And they all got a disease called cowpox. 
they'd get cowpox and they'd get some scabs on them and they'd be sick for a week and then they'd recover. None of the cow milkmaids ever got smallpox. So what Jenner's thing was, well, that's interesting. Maybe cowpox protects you from smallpox. He then goes to one of his workers and says, can I borrow your small boy for a while? So little eight-year-old James Phipps goes and lives in Jenner's house. And what Jenner is doing there is, first thing he did was cut his arm, put a bit of cowpox on him, and young James Phipps got sick. He got cowpox. A few weeks later, James is recovered. He's like, awesome, I can go back to the farm. No, you're not going back to the farm. He then gets some scabs of a smallpox victim and does the same thing. He tries to deliberately infect young James Phipps with smallpox. Of course, the happy thing was that Edward Jenner's hypothesis was right. Now, what you've got there is a situation where you try doing, getting an ethics committee at a university to apply that, say, I just need 20 small boys and we're going to infect them with this disease to try and stop them from getting this disease. It's not going to happen. And look, I, I think there could also be, you know, there could be a question where they do talk about ethics in the HSC and talk about, give an example of an unethical practice that's led to a scientific investment thing in the past. Um, development of flight. This is, of course, people have been trying to fly forever. That's an ancient China. I think I found that. That's the first picture of someone trying to fly. I don't think that would have been very effective. Of course, the ancient Greeks have stories about people trying to do that. Apparently, you know, the, the moral of the story is that you shouldn't fly too close to the sun. I think the moral of the story is use something better than wax to put your wings on. Um, those of you who have studied history. Da Vinci, of course, Da Vinci is well known. He drew designs for things. Now, of course, they wouldn't have worked, probably. Da Vinci was a weird guy. And he actually wrote, he wrote most of his stuff backwards, didn't he? he? He was weird. But you had then Otto Lenthal. What's he done? Oh, you don't need to know this, but he was the first guy that actually made sort of gliders. And then, of course, you get to the Montgolfier brothers, who in France, I think it was, were the first ones to actually do balloon flights. So they're the first ones to actually get off the ground and not die. And then, of course, we have the story of the Wright brothers, who flew a grand total, was it 11 metres, on the first flight. You also have here, think about um, dams. These two last two outcomes are a bit, bit weird here. So dams are good in some ways. You know, there's storage. We, in Australia, we basically use them for those three things on the left. Uh, recreation, not in... Um, a lot of places, but if you go out west of New South Wales, um, the Burrinjuk Dam, which is about 250 k's from here, its main thing is it, it supplies a bit of water, but it's also basically it's where people go speed boating and stuff like that. Most of our dams are for water supply. So Warragamba, you can't go swim in it or anything because it's used for water. And hydroelectricity. Now, of course, here you've got another pro problem with dams. It's one, you destroy the nat natural environment. I think when they, is it the Seven Gorges Dam in China? I think they had to locate, it was some ridiculous amount of people. I think about 50 million people had to be relocated um, just to have this dam, which supplies a huge amount of power in part of China. And also this one little one here, that last one there, which is the Hoover Dam actually caused an earth tremor because they put so much concrete into there it actually destabilized the local geological area now one of the things there particularly that story of jenna leads us to this idea of why we have to regulate science now one of the things there we do this altruistic thing and say science is all about you know nature taking on this journey to go here there and otherwise edward jenner would never be able to do what he did in this day one of the big things in the last few years is this idea of um, genetically modifying children. There was a big story earlier this year about a um, scientist in China who used a biological technique called CRISPR. Anyone tell me what CRISPR is? I never remember it. It's always someone who remembers it. No, CRISPR is a white, yeah? Oh no, you're just, 
Now, I can't remember what it was, Sarah. It's an acronym, and it's basically, you can use, uh, it's a really fast way of changing genetic sequences. So this scientist in China claimed to have made an embryo which was implanted in a mother who was the, some of the genes have been changed via CRISPR. That scientist suddenly disappeared though. And of course, one of the things that you can talk about, in some cases, genetically changing or the design of babies may be good. If you and your partner have a genetic predisposition to disease, you might argue that genetically modifying the embryo before implantation eradicates that disease. But then you can say, well, you know, my partner and I both have dark hair. We really want a blonde white child, which if you're both from Senegali or something like that, it's probably is going to be a little bit weird. And, you know, that's, but there's arguments to say, well, people, rich people in the future might be able to genetically design their children. So if there is a, I don't think anyone's discovered it, genes for intelligence. So you turn the intelligence genes on in your kid. You want your kid to be an athlete. So you, in, um, was it the slow twitch muscles or the fast twitch muscles for those who do PDHPE? If you allow a little bit of gene editing, what's to stop people doing a lot of it in the future? Um, and in Australia and the rest of the world, um, it's all regulated. You cannot clone, you cannot use genetic m manipulation on a human embryo. You also have this other thing here, whether there can be biological weapons. In the US, they've done a lot of stuff with, um, there's been a few bio attacks using anthrax. But if the US and the Russians and a few other countries also have biobanks, which we talk about a little bit later, things where they've got samples. In, is it Switzerland? They've got a giant seed bank. Switzerland? It's one of those Nordic countries of snow. Um, and so there is keeping a whole heap of seeds in case things die out. Now, biological weapons, 100 years ago to win World War I, that's great. Let's throw mustard gas at people. Let's throw vi viruses at them. What was it? I think it was World War II. They were trying to spread flu or something via infected rabbits or dogs or cats or something like that. But we'd say now, that's bad. This one here, testing of pharmaceuticals. This is just an extract from the TGA, Therapeutic Goods Administration. And their job is to ensure that the drugs you get don't kill you. And so the TGA in Australia, you got their pre-market assessment, post-market monitoring, blah, blah, blah. Basically, they approve drugs for sale. And they've got a whole heap of things there. And so most of the time, they look at the side effects. They'll look at studies from overseas and make assessments. So if you've got a blood pressure medication, oh, tickle and throat, persistent cough, some people might say that's better than having a stroke. Okay, this, it's a lot of um, stuff there. Um, and a lot of this stuff here, regulation is about risk. Is there a risk that someone's gonna be harmed? And is that risk gonna be like detrimental or fatal? Of course, we've got here as well, there's benefits of nuclear science. And so I've just taken that from the ANSTO website. They've got a whole thing there. Nuclear stuff is good for your health. Um, nuclear radiation, gamma radiation is also used to sterilize some foods. It's used in a whole heap of ways. So products on nuclear industry, there's good stuff from it. But the main problem there with any of this stuff is that waste is always going to be an issue. What do you do with nuclear waste? You can do what the Russians did in the 60s and 70s and throw it in the ocean and forget it ever happened. That's how you get Godzillas. Um, um, now, we're going to go into this a little bit here. Um, I've got a feeling there is going to be a question, and it could potentially be a seven to nine mark question, on indigenous issues and indigenous rights. So in module five, there was stuff there talking about bioharvesting. And essentially, this is bioharvesting is taking stuff from indigenous cultures and using it. Now, one of the things there, intellectual property, in most cases in Australia, the um, original owners or the, the Aboriginal people who 
have rights over that land. They get a choice and they get a fee for any materials that are taken out of there. Probably the big thing here, and this is one that's very big at the moment, is that a lot of pharmaceutical companies are looking for indigenous medicines and whether there is any use for a lot of those in there and developing products. Now, a lot of this stuff here is, you know, the Aboriginal um, spoken history, so you share stuff. Stuff isn't hidden. And so a lot of these companies know that if you chew this bark, it's going to court help you. So if we have a look here, and I'll, we'll come back to that as well when we go down here to bioprospecting, um, is another little thing here, uses of radiation. Um, you've got exposure to that as well. So that's micro sieverts. So if you get there, you can have up to about 500 micro sieverts in any year. If you go to the, see the people who work in Ansto, they've got little um, chains on their um, belts, which have little receivers that tell them how they're doing it there. Um, pharmaceutical, this is the one I talked about before, the Elderberry project. So I'm going to go through this pretty quickly here. But you see here that the stuff we talked about earlier is actually linked to what we're doing here. And so what you've got to think about here is that pharmaceutical research isn't always an altruistic. So Sydney Uni actually promote on their website, they're actually asking students from other places or academics from other places that if you want to work with a company, we're going to provide it for you. So why, you know, why enroll in industry projects? One of the things I have here is all these benefits. Um, the physics department at UCID actually have a Microsoft lab who's they're working on um, quantum computing. And quantum computing is looking at ways of making processing fast, that there. And so the thing is, you sit are doing the research, Microsoft's paying for it, who's going to make the most money out of that? It's not going to be you, Sid. They're going to make a little bit out of it. But, you know, and this one here, this is Blackmore's. This is the one thing I've put it up, I know, I know I've put it up twice, but it's thing there. Again, out of the research, do you think um, you said are going to say, well, Blackmore stuff is crap? Not when they're paying the money. And so that's a really, really important there. This is going to go through really quickly. And this is a really important thing to think about pharma pharmaceutical stuff. This is just off Wikipedia. This is the list, a s small list of drugs that have been withdrawn from sale because of different issues. Most of them will also be issues that cause people to die. So what there is here is a lot of companies will say, we think this drug is gonna work, trials have shown, oh, it kind of works. They'll put it out for sale. They'll wait till 10% of people taking the drug die, and then they'll say, oh, sorry, we're wrong, we'll take it off the market. And you've got to be very, very careful about this. Okay, GM stuff again. Again, we're repeating ground again. Okay, genetically modified foods. I've already talked about that there. And in this case here, people are worried about possible things that might happen from GM foods. Nothing's ever really been shown at the moment. Um, studies are a bit inconclusive with that there. And, of course, one little thing here, I couldn't find stuff for it, but there was one of the, I think it was Monsanto, um, came up with a uh, strain of wheat that had a big head of wheat on the top there, and they thought, we'll sell this to Africa and that'll help their food problems. However, the strain of wheat they had didn't, wasn't a self-seeding strain, which means that most of the time farmers will get the wheat, they'll leave a few of them there and sow it back into the ground so it grows again. This Monsanto wheat did not do that. So if, if you used it, you had to buy it every year. And so that's another ethical thing. If you create a strain of something that can't self-propagate, you've got yourself a business for the rest of eternity, essentially. Mining. Mining is another little thing here. It can cause... This is where... Polit and this is Australia is at the moment. Mining is it's a be-all and end-all. Um, you know, they just approved the Adani mine, which initially said, we're going we're gonna to have 10,000 people there. They're going to have about 10 people there with robots. Um, 
And so Australia's had a big history of mining. It's been a lot of economic developments. But this is Queenstown in Tasmania. That used to be a forest until they strip mined everything and now it's just a barren wasteland. And so you also got uranium mining. Uranium, good fuel, bad bombs. Most of the research into uranium is now about making bombs. So Australia can make a fortune by selling uranium to Iran or Pakistan or India. Um, but it's like, well, is that ethical? Okay, bioprospecting. This is the one I was sort of alluding to before. Bioprospecting is this idea of taking indigenous stuff and what well, part of it is indigenous stuff and going on there. Um, basically, what you can do is a bioprospector, and this is where genetic technology is really messed up. If a company discovers that a certain gene does something, in this case here, it's breast cancer. This company, and I think I've got, no, that's, I thought there was a link there. Basically, this company discovered that these BRA genes cause breast cancer and patented a test to do it. A, lab, a hospital in Melbourne was sued for testing for the gene because this American company owned the patent. And so you say, is that an ethical use of science? Um, it's just kind of messed up. You have also international stuff here. And this is where we're going to hopefully get through. You, so the UN says cloning bad. Okay. Just imagine a society overrun with millions of Kardashians just running through the streets. It's like the zombie apocalypse, but with more Botox. Um, human cloning banned. Um, what you got there, stem cell research. Stem cell research is also very controversial. Um, Australia, you're allowed to use stem cells from embryos. In the US, you can't. Um, stem cells for the biologists there, are they polypluripotent cells that are able to differentiate into anything else? And that could be a potential. If you lose an arm, you could just get a stem cell graft and your arm grows back but it's not allowed. This is an interesting one in the syllabus as well, surrogacy. You can't have a baby, um, but there's nothing wrong with your sperm and your egg. So you fuse your sperm and your egg together and you ask someone else to carry that to term. Surrogacy is not illegal in Australia, as long as you're not doing it for profit. You can't pay someone to have your baby. You've just got to have someone who's really willing to do it for you, which is normally a family recommend. Um, thing there. That's why some families do a dodgy thing and they go to Southeast Asia where people are very poor and they pay some poor Filipino woman, we'll give you $10,000 if you carry our baby for nine months. In places like that there, it's not illegal to do that. However, if you try and bring that baby back to Australia, that's illegal. And there's no international laws for this. And so it's a, a thing where people think it really needs to um, be changed because there's a lot of people doing this. GM foods, oh look, I'm going to skip through that. Transplantation of organs. Australia has an opt-in approach. If you write in your driver's license or you put in your will, I want to I donate an organ, that can happen. Unless your family says, no, we don't want that. And so, you know, you may know someone who's had an organ transplant. Some, most people wait for years and upon years upon years until that can actually happen. Now, of course, you might be asked a question, how is this appropriate? How are the regulations effective? Now, of course, most of these UN agreements only hold if you say, yes, I'll be nice. If China decides it's going to clone babies, China's going to clone babies. So in that case there, the international agreement isn't really effective. Um, what you've also got there, and this is going over a lot of the same stuff as well, we have here... Social, economic, political, all this here. One of the things there, and this is kind of where I'm up to in my course with my kids, is it ethical, is it ethical to explore space when there are people on Earth that are starving? And of course here, there's a few articles there. Can we end poverty? As I said earlier on, Bob Geldof tried to solve world hunger 30 years ago. People are still hungry. You've got here, why hasn't it been done? You can argue here. This is a bit of an infographic that comes from here. 
space research actually has been helpful. You need water purification systems. If you're going to go to the moon and back, you need an effective filter that can actually filter out all your waste. So if you want to go on the International Space Station, you're going to be drinking your water from your own urine. And they've got the systems to do that. That could actually work in a place like Africa, where the water's really dirty, and so what you can do is clean it. Freeze-dried food. So one of the things there, if you can freeze-dry it over here and take it over there, you can actually um, help people. Baby formula was developed by NASA as a way, you know, maybe the astronauts are, it's basically a way, part of the way of ensuring that food lasts for a long time. Camera phones, you know, it's come from NASA. Landmine removal, so laser sites and things like that. Point I'm trying to make there is that people say, oh, why travel to space? Space has developed technologies that have helped us in other ways. And this is one of the main things, scientific research you start at one place and you end up somewhere else. And when you say, well, no, we shouldn't fund NASA, it's, this is a little bit old. NASA, for its first 50 years, had 526 billion budget. The Department of Defense in the US, and I think this is 2012, had a yearly budget of $683 billion. So that's fine. Argue that space research isn't a valid way. But, you know, maybe you can use three less intercontinental ballistic missiles, you know, and that might help things there. So it's all about perspective. And so what you've got here, and this is more sort of stuff there, but you look here, spin-offs you get from there. Like mini diodes, artificial limbs. Yeah, so a lot of artificial limbs, particularly the working robotic ones, were developed by NASA basically to move stuff around in space. Whole range of stuff there. It, it, that's a bit, and look, that's a biased infographic. Um, how has things helped us out? Nuclear research, it's not all bad. Okay? Fuel, so you compare things here, and this is a bit old. So you got here, you know, coal, it's cheap, or it was cheap. Nuclear is really expensive. Look, in all honesty, most of the um, benefits of nuclear are outweighed by the negatives. And you can look at these in sort of your own time a little bit there. Gas, oil, hydroelectric, they're all pretty cheap. I can tell you this one is actually quite old because the cost of solar production is about the same now as coal. Okay, these costs change over time. It's an economic thing to do with um, basically what's an economy of scale. The more something is produced, the cheaper it is. Okay. Let's go past that. Um, has research in it, nuclear power helped mankind? Yes, it has. That's, we've got so many medical treatments. Another one here, antimicrobes. So we're talking before, antibiotics are good because they've stopped people dying. Bacteria, you know, you know, that's a whole heap of information there. But what I want you to focus on here, when we get to it, this is a graph of child mortality. Why has child mortality gone down so dramatically? What's that? Someone was mumbling over here? No? Antibiotics, essentially. If you look, um, biggest decline is here, 1950s and on. So what was it, 1930, was it 1939 that Fleming discovered penicillin? Or was it around the 30s? This one here, about the 1860s, is actually hygiene. People got toilets inside their house. In front, before 1860, doctors never washed their hands. Doctors were to consider themselves to be perfect. So that's around the time, I think 1880 might be around the time of the Boer War in Africa, um, which is famous because Florence Nightingale um, told the doctors, well, maybe if you washed your hands and didn't operate the next guy in the blood and guts of the 10 previous guys, you might actually save more lives. So hygiene's that dip. That is antibiotics, you know, vaccinations. 100, 100 years ago, half of you would have already been dead because child mortality was so high. And also half of you probably would have already had a family of three kids and the other half would have gone on to war to die in mustard gas attacks. Um, so when you whinge about your Wi-Fi going down for five minutes, just think about that. Um, genetically modified foods, we've done that again. But again, 
here. This is where the syllabus keeps on going back on itself. Okay? And so GMOs have the potential to actually help people um, basically get out of poverty. And that's the main issue in the world. Um, oil, of course, with slightly denigrated uh, petroleum companies. But you guys do actually need oil. Um, medicine, cosmetics, plastics, synthetic, rubber, cleaning products, asphalt. There are a myriad of products that we need oil for. Maybe we shouldn't just put it into cars, we can use it for some of these other things a little bit more. And robotics and drones. So of course drones are a really big thing now. Uh, a, lot of, a lot of you in here will have your own drones at home. They're basically a toy now. And of course in the US they use a lot um, for a ton of stuff. You know, they've got drones that cost a billion dollars so that they can bomb someone in... Um, where, who are America fighting with these days? It's all, all, okay, if you're Arab, America's fighting with you. Um, I think... No, they're out of Iraq now, aren't they? Is it Syria now? I don't know. But um, it's a really interesting phenomenon. It's a new branch of psychology looking at this idea. Um, drone fighters... You know, people who go to war, you get post-traumatic stress disorder and all that there because you see some messed up crap when you go to war. Modern warfare is fought on a TV screen. There's this whole really weird psychology thing where there's actually people who um, get post-traumatic stress disorder because they realise that they've just, they've been sitting 10, 20 minutes from home basically playing a video game that's killed a thousand people. And so there is this really messed up thing there where you just drive home after work and you've been flying a drone all day. Um, but, then, you know, it's a good thing. A lot of media now, you know, you watch a big sporting event and, you know, every big sporting event has to have the drone flying over the players so that you can feel that you're connected. Um, you know, um, search and rescue, things like that. Um, farms. There's some farms in Australia. So some of the really big farms are huge. So instead of driving out there, they send a drone out there and then they can video and see what's going on. And of course, in the end, we've also got some advantages here with um, surgical devices. That is your modern surgery there. It's all nice and clean. There's some of your surgical equipment. It's all nice stainless steel. It's all very pretty. That is a robotic doctor. Um, becoming a lot more common, particularly in things like brain surgery. Because if you're working on brains, a robot is actually better at doing really fine detail. Of course, you could go back to 100 years ago where you got to operate on someone, so you need three people to hold you down. They either gave you a bottle of rum to drink beforehand or a whole heap of ether just to try and get you so drunk that you couldn't do anything. And then, you know, they think, okay, now we can saw the leg off. And, you know, that, and I think this is a... Oh, no, this is a American Civil War picture here. And essentially, you got a gunshot wound, you were going to die. If that gunshot wound got mud and crap in it, you were dead. And so there, they just said, well, you're going to die. Okay, let's just cut your leg off and hope for the best. Um, water purification, again, similar sort of thing here. Why is this? This has helped people's health. And so this is just a graphic there, you know. The water you drink goes through so many steps. I think Sydney water is some of the best quality water in the world. Um, again, you go to the US where they've got probably some of the worst water treatment in the world. What was it Flint, Michigan, where most of the people there actually um, got lead poisoning because their water is just full of lead. And of course, going back to Africa. And this is probably a bit of a sad indictment on us as a society. You know, They've got a choice. They either drink that water, which probably has tuberculosis and things like that in it, or you die of whatever. But you're going to drink that and you're going to die anyway. Of course, this is where space technology has also come in here. There's an invention that came around, which is um, basically a whole series of drinking straws, where even if you've got that muddy, dirty water, you can use this straw, and yes, you do have to suck a lot to get the water up, but the water you're going to get through there is clean. It's not going to kill you. Okay, vaccination as well has been a big thing there. 
And of course, vaccination, as we say there, from about the 1950s on, child mortality has gone down. You know, people don't die of smallpox. Smallpox was eradicated, I think, in 1980. Um, measles was thought to have been eradicated until anti-vaxxers came in. And uh, sorry, and in fact, you'll probably find that in, if you look at that data there in the US in the last 10 years, it's gone up. It just on that graph, it doesn't show as well. So this is where governments and that have a, um, a role in there. Large corporations have a role. Large corporations want to sell you stuff. Governments want you to vote them back in. And so if they kill you, that's not a good thing. Now, of course, Samsung had a few little issues there. Um, the Gal it, was, it was the Galaxy 10 that had a tendency of blowing up a lot, catching fires. Um, there's also, I think I've got that on the next one here. No, sorry. There was also the thing earlier, um, was it earlier this year where they released the first foldable tablet device, which broke about the third time that you folded it. Um, they hadn't done proper industry testing on it. And so that's, that's this idea that you've got to get stuff to market really quickly. And I think Apple's had a few issues with batteries and that. Because, you know what, in all honesty, it's just a different phone, but they buy the products. They buy the components pretty much from the same companies. So if one of them's going to blow up, the other one will as well. Okay, university research. And this is what I was saying before. Basically, um, universities have got this thing now where to get research done, you've actually got to have a product at the end. If you don't have a product at the end, you know, the, people are, the university people are saying, well, why are we funding your research? Um, and that, that's going back to that Blackmores thing there as well. Oh, sorry, did I freak a few people out there? And again, what I said before, Microsoft actually provide. So, got, yeah, so Microsoft initially spent $150 million on this nanoscience hub. So when I, when I took my class to you did early last term, um, they were able to show us there's the door to the, to the Microsoft thing, but no one else is allowed in there. Um, of course, you got here as well, Australia. One of the things that we don't actually, compared to other countries, we actually don't spend a lot of money on research. Universities in Australia have to make a profit of some degree, or they've got this idea now that they've got to make money to do stuff because budgets have been reduced. Of course, I'm going to go over here and I think, sorry, sorry for bouncing around. Um, but let's go in here. We're going to talk a couple of things here about diet and that there, which is, it's a weird um, thing at the end there. In Australia, we have, a, and you look around this room, very multicultural, um, pretty bond people in here. I can see one, but, sorry, it's a joke I make at my school as well. Um, but Australia is very diverse. And you know what, there's no problems with that. But what we've got here is people have different um, dietary needs. You see there, we've got some people, um, everything we had there was halal. I'm assuming if it's halal, it's also kosher because the Muslims and the Jews have similar sort of things there. Um, but of course, body image is the big thing here. This is here, sorry, I'll go back at the top there. The top bit there, that's an image that was given to some people in different countries and they had to Photoshop it to make it perfect. And so what you got there is in every country, there is a different perception of what someone to be attractive is. The Chinese one is weird, she's got a huge head. Um, but, but in saying that, that's Photoshop from that image at the top. All they had to do was Photoshop it, so here Mexico's made the skin a bit darker. You know, that, that's what you expect from different regional groups there. Um, and you know, you go there, Spain, is sort of um, close to the original image and that there. Although, what have we got there? USA, I'm surprised they didn't Photoshop a hair, the blonde thing there. But of course, it's not just women that are the problem there. That guy there is the original image and this is actually bad Photoshop in some cases there. You know, so Egypt, everyone in Egypt apparently has a six pack. Uh,
Russia's an interesting one. Funnily enough, that, I think, though, that might have been Vladimir Putin's office doing that Photoshop job there. Um, the South African one's weird. It's, the skin just changes colour. And funnily enough, the United States has a singlet tan for some reason. Um, of course, there, there is pressure. And I'm going back to some dodgy ads there. 80 years ago, if you wanted to be the perfect housewife, you needed to be taking meth. Because um, the worst thing you want if your husband came home from work, he's had a long day, he doesn't want you there being chubby or anything like that. The house has got to be clean, the kids have got to be ready to go to bed, your slippers and pipe need to be there, and the little drink there ready for you, because you've had a hard day and you don't want to hear your wife's crap. You don't want to hear the kids have been bad. Um, and so, of course, you had to take meth to stay thin. What it did to your teeth, who knows? The other one I showed, I didn't put it on here, was um, in the late 1800s, if your kids had a toothache, you gave them cocaine drops. Or heroin as well. Yeah, you needed a bit of heroin. If you, if you had a stressful day, opium was the way to relax. Of course, you've got halal meat there, and that's got a whole heap of things there. And you know what? Most of you probably don't realise, you go to Coles and Woolies, most of that meat is halal certified. It doesn't make any difference to the meat. Um, and you've also got the Jew, Jewish faith there, so in the Torah. The Torah is a bit complicated. It's you know, like you've got a, a pig. You can't have a pig because it doesn't have a hoof for it. No, it has a hoof, but it doesn't have a card. It's a, religious rules like that just mess with the head because they're so complex. Um, oh, yeah, and you can't have a camel for some reason. Um, but, of course, traditional medical treatments are another interesting little thing here. Acupuncture. Acupuncture is pretty much es established as being, oh, it's traditional Chinese medicine that works. And I think, for some, I think it does to some extent. I'm not sure anyone really knows how it works. No one really knows how it works. Possibly, if it, it's possibly a placebo effect but it's also possibly um, using nerves and things like that. If you're happy to get a Chinese, old Chinese guy to do that to you, go nuts. Um, but these studies that show that it actually seems to work on people. Whether it's placebo, as I said, who knows. And of course, you've got your traditional Chinese medicine, and the less we say about the bits of the tiger that they apparently use, the better. Um, of course, here. Here's where I wanted to get to, and I think this is where we'll almost end on. This relates back to Module 7 and Module 5. And so here is where I think they might ask you a question, which is talking about traditional Aboriginal medicine and potential uses in general society. And so here's just a list of things here. Tea tree oil. That is commonly used now. Um, I think you buy tea tree oil for muscle complaints or something. Um, eucalyptus oil, similar thing, throats, stuff like that. Whole heap of things here. These are all plants. All plants that have been used as traditional medicines. What some scientists will be doing is trying to work out what is actually working inside of them. Mining, we've already talked about a million times. Um, and that is, we're not cahooting. Remember I said no cahooting. We don't have the time. So guys, that is effectively that entire course in about five hours. Um, is, 